Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Ben Rue, Program Coordinator here at the Forum on Workplace Inclusion. I am pleased to have you join us for today's webinar, Inclusive Remote Work, Getting It Right, with presenters Veronica Hukey of DNI Strategy and Solutions and Lisa Kapinski of the Inclusion Institute. This is the first webinar of our 2020 Forum on Workplace Inclusion webinar series, sponsored by Anne. We are very excited to have our presenters from, of our number one webinar, um, of 2019 back to kick off 20, our 2020 series. We hope you enjoy this experience and find this information helpful in your work and join us for future webinars. Today, Veronica and Lisa will be presenting for 40, about 45 minutes with Q&A at the end. Um, please utilize your chat feature in order to ask questions. And also when you do that, be sure to select all presenters or all panelists and attendees so that we can all read it. There will also be polls throughout the, the uh, throughout the webinar, so please feel free to participate in those at the end uh, as well. At the end of the webinar, you will be asked to fill out a brief survey on your experience. Please take a moment to fill out this survey as your feedback helps us shape future webinars. We truly appreciate your open and honest feedback. Today's webinar is SHRM and HRCI eligible? The activity IDs will be provided at the end of the webinar. It is being recorded and being broadcast live on Facebook. The recording will be posted to our website um, within the uh, next week. And like I said, it's also being aired live on Facebook right now. Please visit our website forum on workplaceinclusion.org or visit us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn for more information. Before I hand things over to Veronica and Lisa, I'd like to share a brief message from our sponsor, Aon. Where will today take you? Where will you take today? Will you step out into who you are, into who you can be? At Aeon, we're committed to helping you be your best and ensuring you experience the best of Aeon. It's your chance to own your potential. A chance to develop professionally through unmatched opportunities and tools to help you succeed. It's your opportunity to work with the best, to learn from and grow with each other. A place where colleagues value one another, where perspectives are embraced and people are celebrated. It's freedom to reach out and make a difference. So clients succeed, so communities grow, so colleagues thrive. This is what it means to work at Aeon, what it feels like when we are at our best. Impact, people, opportunities and support. This is the Aeon Colleague Experience and together it's how we'll empower results. Thank you Aeon and without further ado I'd like to hand things over to Lisa and Veronica. Well thank you very much Ben I appreciate it. I see in the chat bar as well some people are saying that they can hear or not hear. It looks like a, a lot of yeses are coming in so we want that don't we? <laughs> we want people to be able to hear. Um, maybe before we jump into the content so you know our voices I'm Lisa Kapinski and well, and I'm Veronica Hockey and I hope that you can see my presentation on my <laughs> screen because we've been struggling before oh and we are good Lisa Signal so well, I can see it. Today. <laughs> Great, thanks very much. So um, we're very pleased to be here with all of you and we welcome you to this webcast. Um, if you'd like to connect with Veronica and I going forward, you see our full names there and on the invitation and we think LinkedIn is probably the best solution that we found in our past webcasts that we've done um, as a way to stay in touch with us and um, stay connected with our future writings that we'll be doing going forward on this topic. So if we could go on to uh, just uh, share with you a bit about what we're going to talk about um, today. We're going to share with you um, a research project that we started. Gosh, Veronica, when did we start this? We thought about it a while ago. ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think we've been about a year ago. Yeah, about a year ago. We were, we were, Veronica and I like to do research and we've done quite a bit and we've shared with you all through this uh, forum for workplace inclusion and, and this particular topic was resonating and percolating up for us like oh this is one that gives us a lot of energy and we started it and perhaps many of you took the survey over the summer um, and we'll be sharing these results with you but we also wanted to bring you in on that journey of our research. 
and share with you that this has actually been one of the most difficult research projects that we've we've had of the many that we have done. Um, and we were so excited as we started out and we were playing with the ideas and then we moved on to actually conducting it. And so many of you were responding with positive comments to us and encouraging us to keep going and exploring this topic about how do you create belonging regardless of where employees work. And then whenever the data started to come in, that excitement kind of went, <laughs> and the middle was a little <laughs> messy and we're going to tell you about that journey and then the insights that emerged out as we did deep analysis around the data and we'll be sharing with you as well what you can do very pragmatic solutions that you can put in place um, to ensure that you have an inclusive workplace regardless of where employees are sitting and working um, perhaps one of the pieces we'll share with you to start off with um, and it's appropriate on this slide, the title slide, is what we struggled with was the title of this work. <laughs> um, so we started because the topic of, or the term remote work is so commonly used out there. There's a lot of hashtags, even if you do remote work, hashtag remote work. And when we talk with our colleagues who are still internal uh, change makers and diversity inclusion practitioners, they're using the term remote work. So we started out saying, well, we're looking at how um, we have an inclusive remote working scenario and we quickly realized that title didn't really work for our intentions and the realities of it. So it's shifted and you'll see now we're talking about it working where, wherever you work. And the reason being why we shift that is, okay, so the first thing is we realize the new reality is people will sit and work in many different locations. And the second piece, the framing of the phrase remote work already set up a bias, um, creating a sense of the norm was to work in the main office, sitting with other people, and those who did not were the remote employees, the outliers. And so that set it up already as labeling um, those who are not sitting in the office against an outdated mode of working. So to start off with our research, I might, project, might title that, an um, issue. Lisa. Lisa, can you hear me? Um, uh, to, to add to that, I believe that one thing that I um, came across as we discussed it also was the importance of really, I mean, not just thinking about, I mean, we sit in the office, I mean, just like, like Lisa said, and so everybody else who's working elsewhere is remote, but it's also recognize, I mean, really this reality of teams that are distributed. So it's not about somebody, I mean, working from home office or from a different location at times, but I mean, there's so many teams now or so many ways of working now that are set up in a way that people just don't sit together. And we really want to, um, to reference that. Yeah, and now I'm going to the next slide. As Go, we're going to do <laughs> that now. So we want to hear from you all. Um, so where have you worked uh, in the last week? So uh, if you would just select all that apply here, where did you work last week? Wow, response are coming quickly. Yeah. And look at that. It's like neck and neck. Um, a company office with my team and home. They're almost equally building out at the same pace. <laughs> that might just be us seeing it, I wonder. <laughs> so Ben, we're about 73% people have responded. So let's lock that in. And um, so Ben, uh, I'm not sure, is everyone able to see the poll results right now? Yes, I'm, I'm sharing the results, so you should be seeing it. Excellent, great. So look at that, how close, 71% uh, uh, at the company office with my team, so, and then from home, 72%. Um, so that's a, a pretty wide divide there. Um, so, Veronica, why don't you uh, share what we're going to be talking about here? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, what we are what we are addressing today is, on the one hand, I mean, we want to set the scene, talk about the research, and we are, as you probably realize, right in the middle of that section already. We also want to talk about um, the research, why we did it, and what we did. Uh, Lisa has touched upon it, but we'll go into more of that. Afterwards, I want to present um, some of the key research findings and really what did we get out of the data, out of the many, many responses and insights that people were willing to provide. And finally, really go into the 
So what did we learn? What can you do if people do feel disconnected? I mean, what are good ways of working? I mean, how do you build connection um, across the distance? Great. And, um, and so, uh, Dan, I still see the poll box up. I don't know if we can remove that down. Or is it just our screen as presenters? It's just your screen. You can close it. There's a box. There's an X in the upper right hand corner that you can. Okay. Just close Thanks it. very much for that. I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, because I want to see <laughs> the slides. So here's Veronica and I. Not only are we live on camera, um, you have a photo here of us too. Um, I think like probably many of you that may be on the call, you know, we have also been internal um, practitioners of inclusion and diversity in our organizations. Veronica, you've been with many companies. Your most recent one was with Philips. And likewise for myself, my most recent one was AXA. Um, and we have uh, since then stepped out and we use our voice and our expertise in another way as partners working externally with organizations. And we bring many years um, of experience uh, in this field. We work with a wide range of client sectors from multinationals to public sector, to humanitarian organizations in the United Nations, et cetera. Um, and, and because we come from a practitioner perspective, and because we both um, have this grounding in behavioral science and, and data, we, we really go deep on evidence-based work and trying to look at root cause issues and what does the data show. And so that's why when I reference, we've done a lot of research, we always do it from a practitioner perspective. What are the insights that we wish we had when we were internal? And so that's um, our approach to our research. And this is one of the, we've done work on women's networks. We did work on DNI actions that have impact. And um, we've done several others. So, um, and probably many more to come. So we look forward to hearing from you what are top of mind for you as well that you'd like us to tackle for research. And we're very pleased to share this with you today. So, um, you know, in terms of this work, we, we're really pleased to be able to combine that practitioner perspective as well as the business critical perspective on this. And it's certainly this topic, as I referenced, um, it sparked the attention both of business leaders and human resource professionals, as well as from employees who want to have greater control over where and how work gets done. So it certainly is a top of mind issue that was resonating in so many areas. And it didn't feel like a, you know, I'll put in quotation marks here, typical DNI issue. It, it crossed um, perspectives in many ways. And so that's one of the reasons why we got really excited around this topic and doing the research, because it integrated multiple perspectives, um, interest levels. And um, as we did a, quite a bit of extensive research that's out there in terms of location, work location, and impact, we saw that there were so many benefits that could happen. And in general, they boiled down to four main areas. One was a, a big cost savings aspect around um, examining where staff and employees are doing their work. Um, there was a space also around the employee experience. They were far happier, greater productivity, um, lower turnover when this was an aspect that was offered. And um, you know, there's another piece that was around global climate change and um, recognizing that this was a way to help reduce emissions. And certainly with the call to action with the UN, this is one of their top three priorities going forward in the next two years. We have a Davos right now with the World Economic Forum making climate change one of the top issues and it really targeting businesses coming in around this conversation. This is certainly another area that's pushing this topic to the forefront. And you know, the fourth area was around, it's the new reality of how work gets done on a global basis. And um, many hubs, even within a country basis in terms of how work gets done. So we felt that this you know, definitely was a top of mind issue. The advantages were really clear, but <laughs> there also were some surprises, <laughs> even with those benefits. Um, and when we talk to people, they were like not in their heads, like, yeah, we get it. This is really a great thing. Now, you know, this is our uh, internal DNI practitioner experience where we see inside the inside knowledge or the inside scoop. And perhaps like you here on the call as well, you kind of do that, yes, but. <laughs> and here's that yes, but. There can be backlash 
around this aspect of new ways of working or working from different locations. You know, some of the things that we have seen is that employees, um, you know, they feel like they need for flexibility, but they don't want to be available all the time, always on. They want to have some safeguarding around the work and the personal domain. Um, or we've seen it where some employees may be looking for it. For example, perhaps you're thinking working mothers. That's typically what comes to mind whenever we talk about working from a different location, which oftentimes the default becomes a working mother working from home. And we all know how that plays out in terms of career advancement. <laughs> um, I say that sarcastically because our experience has shown and the research has shown that there have been some um, limitations that can come about in terms of career advancement based on the distance of where one is working outside of the office and how that plays in terms of connection, being at the right place, um, having the right um, network that you're connected in with, the information flow, and in the end, career advancement. I mean, a real case that I had in a company that I used to work for is uh, on the high potential talent pool, whenever anyone shifted from full-time to part-time working or working remotely, they were automatically removed off of the high potential list. Um, it was only one mode of thinking. The default was high potential was full on in the office, working long hours and visibly in C. So I think that's where our experience as DNI practitioners um, says, yes, we see the benefits. Yes, we see the attention from many stakeholders, but there can be surprises. And the fact, um that proximity matters, that it's not just, that not everything is equal if you're collaborating about um, huge dif distance um, is a well-researched and well-known fact. I and mean, many of you, I don't know, I hope, <laughs> depending on generation, many of you probably remember um, Marissa Meyer when she was um, CEO of Yahoo, who told everybody they had come to, um, to come back to the office. And I mean, she wasn't the first to believe that. I mean, as early as the um, 1970s, an MIT professor, Thomas Allen, researched for the government um, what created success in highly um, complex technical projects. And he quickly found out that there are groups of um, high connectors um, that interacted a lot. And when he um, looked further, what he realized that the fact or what these people had together was that they were sitting closely together. It was really the location of their desks. And what he found was that um, if you can see each other, if you can see the person, if you can see their desk, if you can see the area where they are based, if you see their jacket on the, de on the, on the chair, um, it reminds you of their existence. It, it reminds you that it might be worthwhile to approach them, to talk to them, to, um, to discuss with them. And um, I mean, obviously the 1970s, that's long ago. And since then we've got, um, more telephone, cheap telephone calls, we've got um, email, chats, um, all kinds of functionality. So in 2004, he went back to see, um, did all of that change? And at that stage, what he found was it didn't. The likeliness that you'd send even an email to someone or call them also declined um, with growing distance. And that it really matters to be aware of the other person, um, of their presence in order to reach out. And by now, uh, we've got more technologies, we've got additional um, technologies and support. Uh, the, what hasn't changed is the need to make active use of that and really remind, remind yourself of that, uh, because apparently it doesn't happen automatically. And that was one of the, I mean, of the takings that we, that we had. And so in essence, our, our assumption going into this research was that uh, what used to be an issue for, well, working mothers, and probably for um, talent in remote corners of the world, so um, sitting in other geographical regions, that the same would now impact um, a much bigger population, uh, including a lot of um, white, middle-aged men working full-time just because they were remote and would be cut off um, that regular information stream. And that's what we wanted to explore. And on the one hand, what we wanted to see was, um, so is that true? Is our assumption, does it work? Uh, the second point was, um, what makes it different? What enables people to connect? Um, what, what do organizations, what do people do differently? 
that um, say they feel connected no matter where they are based. And then finally, not just have that in numbers, but to hear it from the horse's mouth. I mean, really to get advice from people that sit apart from their colleagues, that sit um, at a different location and still say, um, I'm good at connecting. I feel highly connected. I'm well included and part of the team and really to understand, so what is it that they do? What are, what are their personal practices? And I mean, we've talked now a lot about um, how organization work and yeah, so let's do another poll question if we could, Ben. Um, so here we'd like to look at your organization. So which is most true? So select one, which is most true for the organization that you're currently working for. Um, and so you have four options there that range from working anywhere is our default, meaning our, our norm, our normative way of working. You have limited options for working in different locations or no one is allowed to work outside of the office or perhaps um, that doesn't necessarily apply and you're self-employed and therefore you have total control hopefully <laughs> around where you're working. <laughs> Okay, um, so Ben, it looks like maybe we could share the results now. So we have here as the, the front runner and the large uh, majority at 71% saying that you have limited options to work from different locations. Within second space around 28% is um, work anywhere as our default or our norm for how work gets done and how um, employees can approach how they do their work. And uh, someone had typed in the chat box earlier on in the previous poll. Um, certainly that can mean a range of things such as we had in the poll question, as well as sitting in an office away from your team. So still in an office, but a satellite office sometimes that that's referred to. Good. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. That helps for us to give an insight in terms of what are the current practices for those of your organizations that are here on this call. So thank you for sharing that. And Veronica, um, we're going to go now into the details of the survey. <laughs> Exciting. Okay. So um, when we started with the survey, we reached out um, to peers, to other organizations and um, to the broader social network community and get organizations, also organizations interested um, in our research because we wanted to find out or we wanted to help them to find out um, what's going on with them. And we believe that this would also enable us um, to see on the one hand, I mean, what, what's happening at a, at a broader basis and what's general perceptions of people, but also get an idea of how does culture impact organizational culture impact um, what people experience. And um, one of those partners who, who came on board and was very excited uh, to do it with us was, was Citrix. And uh, we would have loved to have got um, the head of D&I with us today, um, but he wasn't able to make it. Um, but we will be presenting the findings second time uh, in London together uh, in, a couple of, in a couple of weeks. Um, so overall, we had more than 4,000 people responding to our survey, giving their views, sharing their experience from um, 89 countries. And we've had um, more than 6,000 comments of people who told us what do they experience, what works for them, what are the barriers that they experience. And um, so we were super excited. And more than 2,000 of those comments and um, responses were based on, I mean, the general survey that we did, the, the open survey that we did. And so uh, this is also the basis for the, um, for, the, for the following slides. And as Lisa said before, we love doing surveys and we love doing research. And I mean, for me, and um, it's, I mean, the, the biggest thing is, I mean, you invest a lot of time trying to drive responses because the more responses you get, I mean, the better you're able to really gain insight. I mean, just not just see what's going on, but really understand what's going on because you can cut the data and see who's got a specific experience, what makes a difference in that experience. And so when we close the survey, what we usually do is you download the data, you, uh, you, you build some tables, and then without even looking into the data, you set up graphs and build graphs and look at the visuals 
and information jumps into your face. I mean, you just simply see a trend and you know, oh my God, we're onto something. And then you start digging deeper and you start um, cutting the data to really get a, get a um, full color 3D picture of what happened. Um, the only issue with this survey, we looked at the data and nothing jumped. I did this beautiful visuals, the beautiful graphs and work lo location was not a factor. It didn't have an impact. Um, there was no major differences in whether people felt connected depending on, their, on, on where they worked. And it was a, a our assumption didn't, didn't, didn't hold. Um, instead, what we found when we compared the data was that um, when we asked people, do you feel connected um, with your manager? 17% of those who said, I'm never in the office, said, I feel disconnected. And 15% of those who are always in the office, which is just not a trend. I mean, that is nothing. And so I mean, we, we, we looked at it. We kept looked at it. We tried to, to cut the data, tried to understand what was going on. and. Um, in the end, just just struggled to see this, um, yeah, to see any any clear story. And this is what what Lisa shared. That I mean, the middle was messy. <laughs> yeah, it was. but luckily, <laughs> <laughs> and we 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 close. We learned from our previous um, uh, research to leave the survey window open for six weeks. Oh. So the survey window was open for six weeks. We got these results, in, and we were sharing with you all you know, based on our past experience, we'll have those results out to you, you know, in two months time right after that. And now going into the next piece, that messy piece where we said, huh, it wasn't location. <laughs> okay. Our, our, Veronica really, she's an expert on exactly the data analysis and, and those charts and Excel spreadsheet that I'm just like, wow. And then we saw, wow, there wasn't a clear trend. Well, okay, so we had promised you all we would come back to you in early fall with the findings, and it just wasn't evident. But fortunately, we had something else going on. <laughs> and so we decided to take a pause, and behavioral science says that this is a good thing when you have a complex issue that you're trying to sort out and do deep analysis for problem solving and looking for root cause issues take a pause, hit a pause button. Well, our pause button was to finish up some books that we were writing. So Veronica, I, I think the English version of your book has just been released on Amazon this week. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, so okay. <laughs> congratulations on that. The very big excitement. Um, Veronica first released her book, Fair Leadership in German, and now the English version has been released and is on Amazon as of yesterday. And um, I was wrapping up with Tina Nielsen, my partner with the nonprofit Social Change Initiative Inclusion Nudges, the third edition of the Inclusion Nudges Guidebook. And um, well, that is with the graphic designer, and that'll be released in February. So look for that as well, coming out with over 100 examples of ways that you can nudge and design for inclusion. And one of these we'll be sharing at the end in the tips that we're giving that Veronica and I included in that guidebook as um, an example for you and we'll share here. So yeah, we, we hit the pause button on the research. We finished up our books. We're really excited we started off the year with the release of the books now. Um, but we also, as we were writing it towards the end of the year, we wanted to include the results from the research that we had because it was relevant for both of the content. So we jumped back into the data um, towards the end of last year, and we said, what's emerging here? So Veronica, what emerged? <laughs> what emerged was actually that it was not about location, but it was really about connection, and location wasn't necessarily um, a driver for connection. And um, in a way, it, it, it makes sense. You can have a, a great or weak manager um, who's able to connect and who you feel connected with. And that comes true. And that, that works no matter where you sit. Um, because um, other than um, what, what Alan has experienced even in the two, early 2000s, it's, there is so much solutions now available. There's so much technology now available that it is easy to connect and that it is easy to build um, a relationship um, even across, across distance. And so... Um, Actually, the, the other thing that we, uh, that we found was that, I mean, we shared that, um, uh, that we, we were surprised by just the very same kind of results, whether people were in the office or people weren't. 
And what we found was that it is a key indicator of connection, of feeling connected with your manager, that you dare to ask for that kind of work. So if you're usually office-based, um, it, you won't approach your manager if you don't feel, if you don't, if you don't trust that person in essence. And so actually what we, what we did see was that people who are often um, or sometimes in the office actually feel more connected with their managers because that was an indication that they were able to ask. And in the, in the end, people who felt disconnected from their manager um, were 4.4 times less likely to dare ask um, to work um, from the office, away from the office at times, which means um, having to be in the office always was actually an indicator of a lack of con connection for some. And that was, um, yeah, so it, it, was, it, was a huge, it was a huge thing. And what also became transparent and now um, is that it also opens, I mean, if you don't dare to ask, I mean, that obviously open, opens the, um, the door to bias because you could, um, people could self-quiet self -quiet and um, just not speak up. So their manager might not even be aware of the fact that they wanted to work from different places at times. And um, so couldn't even, well, deal with that approach or with that request in a positive matter, manner, even, even if he or she wanted. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, whether they were aware or totally in the dark, it did have a strong impact because in the end, uh, people who didn't dare to ask to be allowed to, revoke to, to work remote at times were 7.7 times as likely to dislike the way the, the work. So it really had a huge impact um, on work satisfaction. Um, the other thing that we, that we looked at as, as an engagement um, factor was obviously information. Because very often talking to colleagues, what we hear is that um, they are setting up uh, remote working policies. I mean, policies to allow people to, to work from different locations. But in the end, people return to the office because they feel cut off. They get the impression, I don't know what's going on. And again, what we found was there was no difference on I've got the information I need based on work location. But we had a massive difference. People who felt disconnected from their managers were also 5.3 times as likely to say, we lack information. And that was in, independent of where they sat. So, it, it, and it makes sense. I mean, if you trust your manager, um, you are more likely, or rather if your manager trusts you, he or she is more likely to, to reach out, to ask, um, are you, um, to consult with you in the early stages of, of a project. I mean, just to share information with you that might be either confidential, or at least not broadly known. You are more likely to be part of the office gossip and just the, the talk. I mean, that is not just in the office location-wise, but can also be across the distance. And I mean, the a third factor that's strong, obviously connected with engagement, is believing that you've got equal opportunities. And again, people that uh, didn't feel connected with their manager were way more likely to say, well, it's not fair what's going on here. Um, not everybody has the same opportunities and uh, there, is, there are differences. And Finally, what we want to understand is, so what happens with the, within their team? And we saw that um, people who felt disconnected from the manager at the same time are nine times more likely to feel disconnected from peers. So very often there's a trickle down effect, which can either be uh, that you've got this kind of um, follow the herd instinct. So you know, oh my God, this person is not popular with my manager, so I'd better also stay off. Um, or alternatively, it just shows that this bridging of different people and the ability to talk as a team and to, to share within a team just doesn't exist, uh, which impacts people's, people's experience. Um, but whatever it is, in the end, it's got an impact. And that's back to you, Lisa. Well, I've been writing to the panelists on the chat section while <laughs> okay. you've been covering the data. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, um, Veronica, um, maybe you can continue on with this slide um, about the implications okay. of all the data that you've just shared. Just uh, anything I need to repeat? I mean, otherwise, well, come back there were some questions that were coming in as you were talking about the data around clarity. So maybe I'll just also verbalize that. And one was around um, hesitant to ask. And that was yes. I think, uh, Kathy, you may have brought that out, or, or uh, Lisa H., you may have brought that out. It is hesitant to ask if I can work remotely from the office. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, there was um, a space around, uh, Randa, you helped to clarify about the, the relationship of fear for asking. Um, and as Veronica talked about, the, the, the rise could be for bias coming up, that if I'm more fearful to ask, if I'm hesitant to ask, um, I may self-silence, or if the majority are sitting in the office and you have that follow the herd dynamic, you continue to maintain status quo. Um, so thanks very much for your questions that you all were asking around clarity on that. And then there were some few questions there in terms of actual percentages. And uh, that I'm sure makes Veronica's heart beat warmly because she, <laughs> between the pair of us, uh, she's very much in that space. And um, uh, we, as I shared, we'll be doing some further writings um, around this research on an ongoing fashion throughout the year. And we're targeting an initial report that we'll share with you all in February that will give the more specificity around the data. Um, I think the question was, Veronica, it was around the person, did we ask age groups? And as yes. we were looking through it, so you want to talk a bit about that was one of the analysis frameworks that you had in place. Exactly. In essence, I mean, what, what happened was that uh, I mean, just we still need to do more analysis with the with the data and um, dig deeper into the um, individual groups, because as uh, as Lisa shared, what happened was that um, we really took this pause because we couldn't see what was going on. And then we saw this trend, but we haven't yet done the analysis on um, age groups specifically. We've got, um, we, we've asked gender, um, we've got information on, on location, we've got information on uh, um, do you have um, a caring responsibilities um, or don't you? So all of that we'll be working at. I mean, what I can share is that we looked at that with the factor of does it impact disconnect in terms of location? And we couldn't see that. Um, there was no major differences. So none of that um, in that early analysis um, drove those trends. So please stay with us. We'll be back. There will be more. And also I'll make sure that we share more of the percentages because we've been discussing that. I mean, also, I mean, do we show the actual graphs with all the percentages and in the end decided to go for, for something easier? But also, I mean, if you've got a keen interest, I mean, reach out to me and I'll be happy. <laughs> yeah. so, so back um, again to our report in writing, um, we, we will LinkedIn, we'll be posting on LinkedIn. And as well, we talked with Ben yesterday that you all um, on the forum for workplace inclusion have a place for articles. So we'll also making sure that there's a link to any articles that we write there as well. So um, that's another place. But in yeah, the I mean, actually, initial I, review, Veronica, there was nothing that flagged up um, around no, age. So, exactly. Yeah. So um, again, it was defying our assumptions that we were coming into as long-term DNI practitioners of what we thought we would find in the data. Although in a way, I mean, at some stage, I mean, if, as we returned, we also um, believe that it is still pretty much a, a DNI issue. Um, yeah. Because in the end, it is if it's about connection. I mean, you will be more likely to be connected with your in-group, and your in-group is going to include people like you. Um, so that's uh, that's why I'm off my issue. I've got one question, two questions here showing up, and I'm getting um, a little bit confused. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, one was, um, did we weed out underperformers? And um, no, we didn't, because we we had no way of knowing how people perform and how they would be judged by others. Although we've got um, a database that is, I mean, with the with the response rate that we've got. Uh, that should uh, that shouldn't be an issue because it's uh, yeah we've got a very sound response rate uh, with the um, limited number of cuts. Yeah. And, and in terms of implication, I mean, this was a this was a clear piece of data that you found as well, Veronica, as you were going through and looking what was emerging, and that was that sense of disconnected staff who are disconnected from their manager were twice as likely to leave if they were given an interesting opportunity. So, you know, when we're trying to focus on retention of, uh, you know, wonderful talents inside the company, 
oh, connection really does matter, doesn't it? <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll come into the, um, we, we'll get into the, what can you do to connect? What are the um, aspects that make a difference? Uh, momentarily. And so yeah. this was Lisa already covering this chart. Uh, yeah. So yeah, they're way more likely to leave and um, unlikely to give it second thought if an uh, interesting opportunity arises. Yeah. And yeah. So we have our third poll question at the end because we want to hear from everyone. And yes, there is time for questions coming up in a moment. Um, so let's do this poll question and then we're going into some practical things that you can do. So what we'd like to know here um, in terms of uh, what do you know inside your organization? So have you tested the effectiveness of the current approaches that you're using to enable collaboration across distance? So working across distance. Um, so that's within your organization ranging from you do it regularly, you analyze it, you have data, evidence. Um, going down to we've done the analysis, but we haven't acted upon it yet. Um, or we have an assumption or we believe that we understand it, but we haven't tested it, so we don't really have the data there. Or we haven't analyzed it yet, we don't have data, we haven't looked deeply at it, or I'm uncertain. <laughs> and it looks like this is a, uh, a lower end of the scale in terms of actions and analysis that could be um, needed. Um, just like with us, we thought we had the answers and assumptions going into this, but as we looked deeper, a different picture emerged um, and one that had consequences on retention um, and had consequences when we talk about de-biasing organizations and where this could be opening up that door um, and shining a light on where bias could be at play. So yeah. um, the vast majority is at uh, almost equally split between the bottom ones at, um, for those that can see it here, 38% as the front runner, we haven't analyzed it yet. 31% um, are uncertain, don't know if that's being done, and 28% believe that we understand it, but we haven't tested it yet. And equally, only 5% that you've analyzed it regularly or you've analyzed it, but you haven't acted upon it yet. So, um, insight is important. And um, yeah, thank you very much for sharing that with us. That was really helpful to see. And uh, Veronica, shall we? Yep. On? Yeah, and it's, it's, it's really interesting to see that, I mean, many organizations apparently are pretty much in the same place as, as we are. I mean, certain that we've got the answer and then find out, oops, we don't. Um, but... <laughs> and, and so analysis, someone's <laughs> asking, what do we mean by analysis? And we'll cover that towards the end. So um, that's just in a sense meaning you've taken a look at it, though, and you understand the dynamics that are at play and how, what is the employee experience and the manager readiness around that. Yeah, I mean, in a way it is, um, if Marissa Meyer had um, done this kind of analysis, she might not have rec uh, called everybody back in the office, but has, would, could have considered different ways of connecting across the, the distance. But it was a different time. Um, it was different technology. So um, it was, yeah, different setting. So, I mean, what, what was very, very clear for us was that the ability to connect as a leader, um, and, and that's really whether it's with, with peers, with your staff, um, uh, whether it's clients or other stakeholders. I mean, you need to be able to do it. It's not a choice. Um, it's a requirement. And you also must be able to connect about the distance. And I mean, that is just an essential part of it. And so the answers that we found um, through the research was, number one, have a policy. <laughs> I mean, if you're talking, this is now really talking about um, uh, employees that are predominantly office-based, it is important um, to have a policy. What we did see was that in organization where there was a, com a policy, staff was considerably more likely, um, 1.6 times as likely to say, I dare ask, even if they didn't feel connected with their boss. So this bias was kind of uh, weeded out or reduced, and this self-silencing was reduced. And having a policy, and I think that's very important, is that it's not sufficient um, to have it on a piece of paper. It's not su uh, support to just write it up. Um, it's also not, not, not sufficient uh, to, to just talk about it, just to communicate it. But you really have to see that people are living it. And that's an option that's available, that's okay to do, that others do it, um, which also indicates um, that you can do so as well. 
And it was so funny when we talked to um, some of the, um, well, not at all funny, actually, when we talked to some organizations that, um, who told us, yeah, we've got a policy, it's broadly communicated, it's fabulous. And then we researched the organization and their staff said, no, we don't, I'm not aware, I have no clue, or sometimes commented, well, they say we've got a policy, um, but um, I don't think that I'm supposed to make use of it. So really important, not just, um, so develop it, set it up, communicate it, and live it, because in the end, I mean, also working flexibly, connecting, interacting in different ways, and that's something that we, uh, we saw is clearly a team practice. And we can show that, I mean, really based on the data. If a team does it, um, everybody does it. If it's uncommon in a team, people will hesitate. Yeah. And Veronica, also in the policy piece, the confusion around policy, we heard both from um, staff and leaders. So even though yes. there may have been a policy there, but there was uncertainty, how does it apply? Do I use it? Is it, is it really supported by the leaders? Um, we heard that both from managers and staff. Yeah. Lisa. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Me. <Veronica. laughs> um, another thing that we looked at was, especially for distributed teams, um, we clearly saw the importance of having in-person meetings. So people that said, yes, we regularly have opportunities where the full team meets in person. We're considerably li more likely to say, I feel connected with my manager. I feel connected with my, with my peers. But also we're likely, more likely to say, um, as a team, we manage to include everyone effectively. At the same time, um, of the people that were working remotely, only 40% says um, that it's common, that it happens. So I believe it's um, an underused opportunity to make a difference and it still matters, especially probably in the early stages um, of, of team development. Yeah. And um, now here, as someone had asked earlier on, can I give some examples of inclusion nudges? Um, well, here are two that are coming up for you. And, and this one, Veronica and I wrote up and it's in the upcoming third edition of the inclusion nudges guidebook, checklist. Checklists are a fabulous way to um, close that intentions and action gap that we have um, to ensure we do what we want to do. And, and most leaders and managers and team members say we want to make sure that everyone has a chance to speak on the team, to share ideas, that we get the best ideas to aid our innovation process, creation, decision making, etc. But what can happen <laughs> in virtual teams, quote unquote virtual or quote unquote remote, um, is it's out of sight, out of mind. You know, if you've got some people that are sitting together physically and then some who are calling in or Skyping in, by the way, that's not a good way <laughs> to have meetings. If someone is calling in or, or using a, a virtual uh, connection platform, all should be doing that. So you equalize the experience and you don't have side conversations. But another space to make sure those conversations are happening with equity across everyone in the team is to integrate a checklist into the agenda. And uh, the team facilitator or the manager um, has that checklist and make sure that everyone has been invited and specifically um, recognized or called out to speak on the topics on the agenda and tick that off as the conversations happen. Now, not doesn't mean that you're forcing people that they have to contribute, but you're opening up the space for them to be able to contribute. And we know that there can be many cultural variations, there can be um, expertise levels that may mitigate in terms of the amount or the type of contribution that people may want to make, but you're making sure that you have opened up that space for all voices to be heard. The checklist also enables you to start noticing patterns, you know, and part of de-biasing or designing ways to ensure equity is to notice what we typically don't notice. And so if you start ticking off every time someone is contributing around a topic, then you start seeing who are the more dominant speakers, perhaps, who tends to, to um, head up speaking the most talking time. And that helps you to start designing ways in your meeting facilitation that can ensure more equity and that you don't have this out of sight, out of mind piece around um, teams that are sitting in different locations and how they get work done. 
So this one is written up in the third edition. And then the next one actually has to do with how do we connect informally? And cameras matter. Um, so Ben shared with us yesterday as we did the run through that he's heard from many of you all that you really wanted to have the cameras on because it helped you to connect with the speakers. I'd love to see you all too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that might be hard with the hundreds of people that are here. Um, however, with Teams, it is important to have cameras on. Um, but another space that Veronica and I recognize from our own experience having working globally and, and been across multiple time zones, sometimes you're perhaps talking to people that are in the evening time or early morning time and, and they actually might not be fully pulled together <laughs> as their other colleagues who are in the daylight times. So there's sometimes that maybe cameras don't want to be on or we've talked we had a lot of respondents from the survey in some countries that said we have some infrastructure issues around Wi-Fi connectivity, and it's better only connect by audio rather than video. So um, one example that we have uh, came from um, Mignon Tholson, who's at Amnesty International in the US, and what she does to enable that is they have photographs up on all of their websites um, so that anyone in the organizations as they're talking can actually just go to the website click the person's name and a photograph appears up of the person. So at least that is a way to substitute. And why is this important? We're primed from an early age to respond to a human face. We feel more connected. We tend to listen more closely. Um, and we have a stronger sense of trust and belief in what they're saying. Um, so a lot of research has shown that the face matters <laughs> and it certainly enables connectivity to happen. So where and how you can in your team meetings with people working across multiple locations. Try with camera. Um, try also to weave in informal ways to connect with each other. So not just the structured piece, but also checking in, having virtual coffee or tea breaks together. All of these things matter to create a sense of um, coziness and, and connection and um, a stronger sense of team belonging. Yeah, and that was really um, fascinating when we um... I'm really filtered the data by people that don't sit with their teams, but feel strongly connected um, with, their, with their peers, with their colleagues, with their manager. I mean, the most, the overwhelming um, advice they had to give was really connect informally, um, do calls that don't focus on a business topic, but really make sure to make that um, social, to bring that social connection, that social interaction, um, into the virtual environment. So the experience that you probably have in the office, because you just walk by somebody's um, desk and just sit with them and, I mean, quickly chat. I mean, try to do the same thing um, also across the distance. Yeah. Because, something else? Uh, there was a question that just popped oh. up as well around um, the checklist. <laughs> so the checklist is by topic and by participant. So you're, you're making sure that you're having all voices in. And there is quite a bit of respondents about the tips here in the chat room, um, Veronica. So many people have ideas and energy, it sounds like. So looking forward to hearing what they're wanting to share with us, which is, I think, coming up next. Well, coming up next. So our message is generally connect no matter where you are. And it's important in the office as well as outside the office. Um, connect with people who are different from yourself. Connect. That matters. And Exactly, just like Lisa say, we'd love to hear how you're doing it. And what are the ways that you connect? And now Lisa is the smart one who's got the chat and I can't see it. So well, please, Lisa, share some. Yeah, and Ben, I think you're going to open up microphones. So however you want to moderate any questions you all have here or tips that you'd like to share with us and how you're connecting. Oh, um, no, like present, presenters, or I'm sorry, only presenters can speak. That's uh -huh. um, attendees we encourage to put their questions okay. in the chat. So allow me to be the voice of mm -hmm. you all who are out there. So um, I see here that uh, Stephanie has shared that you have virtual meetings all over the country. Um, that's great. You know, I, I think when I worked internally for over 20 years, uh, the last time I actually sat in a physical location with my manager out of those 20 years was probably in year three. And then after that, I never sat with my manager. And one thing that we would do once a week is we would at random make sure we had coffee together um, and it would be unstructured and unscheduled. 
Um, here are some more coming in here that it is important to have a virtual lunch with team members um, uh, who are not sitting in the same office. Um, that's a great idea. Um, uh, you do teleconferences with multiple offices. You have Google Chat, so certainly there's a lot of technology around chat and, and that can be a very helpful thing. One thing that we found in the research around chat space is recognize time that you're on and time that you're off. Um, so that there's a space where you um, are not having to prove, you know, if you're sitting in another location and, and this is a space where inequity can come in that you feel like you have to be immediately responding. So that's back to the policy space in terms of just having clarity and how you do the work that chat is not an always open space, but you also have dedicated time to work on your Yeah, work. and I mean, that was another co comment actually that came out um, also loud and clear from, um, from survey participants was the importance to find ways to allow for um, asynchronous working to make sure that you don't have to respond immediately, but that people would post their ideas and you could respond in your own time. So you still have the impression that you are part of it, you can see the full discussion, um, but you don't need to be there at a certain moment in time. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of great ideas coming in and I hope in that you're gonna be able to save those and those will be attached to the recording. So this is where it's really important that we wanna have your ideas typed in here because that becomes a running log to help all of us work in a better way. Um, and one thing, you know, I really keep doing and Veronica does too, we slip into sometimes saying remote work and then we keep pausing back and saying, oh, we have to get rid of that term because imagine if, you know, and that has been both of us in our careers, sitting outside of the headquarters office or the main teams and we're, we're the remote ones, we're the outliers. And how can you be inclusive whenever you've labeled someone as the remote person? Um, so language really matters and that's something we need to work on. So there's a, several things in terms of chat coming in around technology-based solutions and then there's the human interaction around those technology-based solutions. There was another one in terms of whenever meetings open up, you all said that you were putting a couple of minutes early on in the agenda to talk about something that's not work-related. Um, and if Scott I uh, was here from Citrix. That's a practice he's been doing for a couple of years when he was at the Gates Foundation and now at Citrix, that he has a question um, every meeting that's um, outside of work context where it's open for anyone to respond and that helps back to the point that emerged from the survey, connection matters. Um, and uh, Daniel De La Paz asks, do you have, <clears throat> do you have an example of, po of the policy you reference? What does that policy look like? You mean um, distributed work policy or work everywhere policy? I mean, policies really need to be adapted um, to an organization, to an organization's culture. And I mean, what what's important? I mean, maybe it might it might be worthwhile to to go to the next um, to the next slide because it addresses part of that. I mean, you have to be aware of your goals and intentions. I mean, the way you st stand as an organization, um, what you can do, and then you have to adapt. Um, your policies and your uh, your frameworks and um, ways of working um, to that to your own organization's rea reality. So it's really it's about understanding where you're at, where you want to go, um, and which way to get there is likely to work um, in your organization. Lisa, what do you say? Yeah, and I th I think that there's there's we kind of what we saw is sometimes there's have a policy, don't have a policy. So policy is just how it happens and how you, how you structure it. And then there's the space of living the policy. And that's where we saw a lot of the breakdowns happen, where managers interpreted it differently. Um, yet their colleagues on the DNI team or in HR would say, yeah, we have a policy. Um, yeah, we have a great policy. But as we did analysis inside organizations, and a lot of times we come in and we do cultural audits with organizations, and we'll look at, do you have a policy? And then how is that policy showing up? How, how are managers or staff hearing about it, using it? What happens whenever um, questions come up? How, that's whenever you test the policy, conflict issues come up. Um, how are they resolved against that? And generally, we're finding that that is a big gap between first, if you have it, then secondly, if you have it, or is it being used 
with equity across the organization. And if not, that's where we start finding bias playing out in the organization. So there, there as we have here, many ways um, that you can take this forward. We always, in terms of our work as change makers and, and designing for organizational changes, start with the end goal in mind. So what is your, your end goal and your intentions that you want to have in terms of how work gets done? Um, and then secondly, what is your current state? Do that audit analysis around understanding what's currently going on inside your organization. Then it's the ability to deliver on your intentions. And, and as we talked about, that's infrastructure and that's also policy. That is capability. Um, and it's equally important to understand your staff's experience, your leader's experience, and are there implications such as on retention, uh, external reputation, ability to track talent, productivity. Um, are there any issues showing up across different regions in terms of perhaps maybe it's headquartered centric and, and not so equitably applied across all countries globally. And then it's the manager's capability um, and not only to support it, but to do it. <laughs> so to work anywhere, they also set the tone and role model and um, help to make this an organizational practice. So if you have any questions, um, as we said, LinkedIn is a great way to connect in with us. Um, or Ben, I know you can help connect if anything comes up to bridge that gap. And we'll continue on doing further writings, analysis, articles throughout the year, linking this always from a pragmatic perspective of practical tips that you can put in place. And we look forward to also looking what you've shared here and we'll be able to incorporate that as well in future articles that we share back with you. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much. And I want to say uh, you know, many thanks to Ver wait, uh, was, wait, was that wrapping it up? <laughs> Oh, Kit Tennis. <laughs> I was curious. I was like, are we, where are we? <laughs> he says, thank you to Lisa and Veronica. Kit Tennis, <laughs> nice to hear from you. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, again, uh, I just want to say thank you to Lisa and Veronica, and I want to say thank you to everyone who uh, participated in today's webinar, and a special thank you to our sponsor, Aon. Um, as promised, the... Uh, Um, so I think that many of you have noticed, I don't know if you can hear. Me I'm sorry, I forgot to unmute Kit, myself. <laughs> unmute yourself. You're the first. I pro. apologize. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's so funny try, just trying to, um, yes, I apologize. So I'm going to do that again. I'm going to say thank you to Lisa and Veronica for this <laughs> outstanding webinar. And I also want to thank you all for being here today and thank our sponsor, Aon, for their continued support. Um, you saw that I posted the SHRM activity ID, in, the SHRM and HRCI activity IDs in the chat, but the SHRM activity is 20-ME9JE and the HRCI activity is 702588. Again, uh, the recording, this podcast, or sorry, I knew it would happen sooner or later. This webinar was recorded and will be posted to our website within the next week, along with these slides and any other resources that, uh, at, and, that um, Veronica and Lisa would like to share. And um, we are going to be taking a brief hiatus uh, from webinars for the conference for the next couple months, but we invite you to join us in April for the uh, white fragility and microaggressions in the workplace when good people behave badly with presenter Nancy Michael on Thursday, April 23rd, 2020 at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. A new episode of our forum podcast is now available. Yes, we do do a forum podcast as well, which is why I said podcast earlier just now. Um, so, so visit our website, forumworkplaceinclusion.org backslash podcast to listen. You can, uh, the forum podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and more. Um, <clears throat> and 
Finally, the registration is now open for the 2024 Mon Workplace Inclusion Conference here in the Twin Cities facing forward to March 10th through 12th at the Minneapolis Convention Center. For more information on upcoming webinars, podcasts, the conference and other upcoming events, please visit our website forumworkplaceinclusion.org or you can follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Just search Forum Workplace Inclusion. Again, I wanna thank Lisa and Veronica, and I want to thank you all for joining and hope you'll be joining us for future webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great 2020.